So, um, using a, a, a virtual whiteboard today, we did uh, some sessions at the HIMSS conference about a month ago, and they were uh, very well attended um, and had a lot of requests for, gosh, I wish, I wish somebody else in my organization could uh, have a chance to see this presentation and engage in a little more knowledge about FIRE. So, one of the things that's interesting about a virtual webinar with a bunch more people is the fact that uh, what the, the sessions we did at uh, HIMSS were really a whiteboard session where we had an opportunity to really uh, customize the, the content and, and have a lot more Q&A. Um, as Jeff indicated, I'm planning to stick around afterwards and answer questions that anybody has. I'm also uh, eager to take email questions if you have them uh, or, or engage me on uh, Twitter if, if desired. Um, so to, to kind of get the same uh, virtual show of hands, I'm going to have uh, Jeff put up a couple polls for me to kind of help uh, understand who you are. If you can start by kind of giving me some sense of your technical or clinical skills. A lot of interesting folks uh, in terms of ranging from, I would say, highly technical uh, coder types that have been working on engines for, for a while all the way up to those uh, former caregivers or, or active caregivers that are providing uh, care to patients every day. One of the nice things about FIRE as you guys work to answer this question is the fact that it's accessible to a wide range of people. Uh, and we can see that um, th those of you that, are, that, that answered the call are 0% uh, caregivers, so no, no hands-on. Um, interestingly enough, at the, at the Connectathon last week in uh, Paris at the working group meeting, the last two days uh, was dedicated to a clinical user connectathon. So we had active technical types that might be the recovering caregiver type that's underrepresented here, actually working with Fire to, 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 to connect with a clinical uh, bent. So this is great information to know that most of us are technical. Um, our, our next poll question is uh, focused. Um, Similarly, um, but in this case, it's your job focus. So we know that we're mostly technical in nature. Um, give me some sense of where that technical skills are focused. Are you an engine person? Are you um, casually interested in interoperability? Uh, or is there a, a, some other focus in your role? Appreciate you guys answering. Uh, once again, we're primarily focused on or um, almost exclusively uh, focused on interoperability, which is also very helpful. So we're, we're uh, over 80% over, uh, here in terms of that focus. Uh, third of four polls that were going to kind of help me understand who you guys are, um, how much of that technical focus uh, on interoperability do you guys have? Are you just underway? Uh, and or do you have lots of experience? And by interoperability, I'm typically talking here about HL7 version 2. Uh, maybe you're an old Cloverleaf or eGate user. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to, to also uh, use our CorePoint platform. Give me some sense of how long you've been at that. Also good to know, almost everybody uh, has got some experience. The last question then will be around actual knowledge of FHIR. Uh, it's sort of embarrassing as a technical guy to say, I don't know really much about FHIR, but it's okay because this is all anonymous. Uh, if you just kind of heard FHIR and don't really know what it is or why it exists and that's why you're on the call, uh, give me an answer on one or two there. Otherwise, um, on up the, uh, up the food chain, right? You've read quite a bit of the specification, or you can actually talk about the resources, uh, or maybe you've attended a working group meeting where you've um, done interoperability uh, testing, poking around. So again, not terribly different than what we had at HIMSS, where uh, with the exception of a few folks, most people are, are interested in learning more um, with, uh, that's, that's interesting, 20% 20, 20 or so of you all have, have dug into the specification, which is cool. So th this is very helpful. Uh, I appreciate Jeff's help getting these polls up. Um, what I want to then focus on probably is providing that um, more technically oriented um, overview of FHIR. Um, very similar to what we did at the at the HIMSS show. So let me go ahead and, and, and get started. Um, the, the 
the beginnings of this to kind of set the stage are I like to, to, to kind of draw a couple applications. If we imagine that this is my hospital information system and uh, out of my hospital information system you can imagine that I've got a database and maybe on the right hand side here I've got a laboratory information system and of course I've got a, uh, a different database over here, right, different data model, different approach to um, the, the methodology that's used to store that information. Left hand side might be a, a SQL Server database, the right hand side might be a MUMPS database, and in the, in the classic picture that we draw, um, we're of course taking data out of this uh, HL7, um, or out of this database, and we need to translate this into an, an HL7 message that will actually move across the wire and then be put into uh, the receiving database. And this is, this is what HL7 D2 is really all about. It's how do we take the data model of the HIS and translate that uh, into first HL7 D2 and then into the, the, the laboratory's data model. So I, I like to draw these pictures, right, that, 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 the, that, that the source module over here, um, I like to call the HL7 export module. And over here we've got the HL7 import module. The whole point of drawing this picture, uh, given that everybody's got quite a bit of HL7 experience, it's just to kind of remind ourselves, well, what is it that, that we're doing when we translate to and from HL7 v2? There is a, uh, a process that we go through which translates the, the, the uh, EMRs or HISs or EHRs uh, data model, how they store patients, how they store results, into the HL7 format and vice versa. So beating that particular dead horse, the whole point is we translate at least twice. Uh, in addition, obviously, if we've got an, you know, if we imagine that there's an interface engine in the middle uh, of this uh, environment, right, the engine allows us to take in one flavor of HL7 and send out another flavor of HL7. And ultimately, along the way, of course, if we're going to have a bidirectional interface, we would run that back through the interface engine going the other direction. So there can be multiple moving parts along the way. I'm going to align the interface engine in the middle, and we'll just you know, draw this as a point-to-point -point interface. So we've got data coming in and going out, back and forth between um, these these two systems. Um, the, the the first place that I think we can talk about fire being uh, applicable is uh, and, and easily adoptable is imagine that I'm the lab vendor over here and I would like to create an application for my users, one of whom is a phlebotomist. So I want to create uh, some form of an application running on a tablet or running on a phone, and I need some way for this user now uh, to gain access to the data that's sitting in my lab environment. Clearly I can do that in a proprietary way or I can do that in a, um, in a standard uh, off-the-shelf kind of way. Historically, the way this has worked, of course, is I've, I create my own platform. I pick my own technology to, 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 to provide the interactivity between my database and my application running over here. Uh, it's proprietary to my users. Uh, it's proprietary to my, to my stack. I don't publish an API over here that allows you know, an arbitrary developer to write code against the same uh, interface that I've, that I've published for my, my own use. So one of the options we, uh, opportunities we have that's available to me uh, in, in uh, FHIR is the fact that I could choose to make this be a, uh, an interface uh, that uses FHIR. So if I stand up a FHIR import or export module and I write my application on the right-hand side using the FHIR uh, API, I now can communicate back and forth between, again, my database where I'm going to map between my data model and the FHIR HL7 FHIR data model. And um, what goes back and forth over here is, of course, a, 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 a FHIR messages that are, that are transitioning back and forth. FHIR comes in two flavors, right? I can either send back and forth uh, XML versions of this, uh, or I can send back and forth uh, JSON versions, which is basically a, a, um, a comma-separated uh, object list. Uh, so, so these are the two, two choices I have to exchange data back and forth. And the main motivation here isn't to focus on the technology, but to say, why is it a vendor would be interested in adding this functionality um, into their environment? And this is one of the first major cases, which is 
uh, in review, I as a vendor want to gain access to data inside my application. Rather than doing so in a proprietary way, I'm going to, do, I'm going to accomplish it through FHIR. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, is once I've got FHIR uh, and a specification of my FHIR API, this does allow an arbitrary uh, uh, programmer type to come in and access the same data through the same API. So th this is kind of one of the interesting things that FHIR presents uh, is that if I'm using the standard, it allows more than just my own coders to gain access to uh, this information. Now the interesting part of this and, and where the conversation really starts to, to become intriguing is uh, if we imagine that um, in addition to the lab system supporting FHIR, we could imagine that our HIS system may also have a FHIR API that's available to anybody within the, uh, the facility. This now allows uh, this application over here written by the lab vendor to not only talk to the lab system directly, but also talk over here to the EMR, uh, which is really the first greenfield opportunity that, that often people ask, well, when are we going to replace HL7 D2 interfaces that are sitting here in the middle with fire interfaces? And I like to think about the fact that instead of replacing them, we're going to be augmenting those interfaces uh, with this interactive kind of access, right? What, what HL7 D2 does not do is allow an external application to access the data that's sitting in the database at the source of truth in real time, right? That we think of HL7 D2 as being more workflow oriented in exchanging information back and forth between systems when something happens on a source system we create an HL7 V2 message and send it across the wire. Fire, on the other hand, is a protocol that allows for the capabilities of a given system. And in my two examples here, the HIS system supporting a fire API and the lab system supporting a fire API, these two lab system, uh, these two systems to be able to have a similar uh, implementation of fire with a, with a specification and then allowing an arbitrary application to communicate with both of them uh, in real time. So this is the, the, the first takeaway that if we ignore all of the hype that, that exists in the marketplace, what FHIR is going to provide us is the ability to connect effectively to the source of truth uh, in, in a, uh, in, inside the four walls of my hospital and uh, interact with that data. Now whether this interaction is uh, read-only or read-write, is uh, something that is uh, uh, left up to the implementer, right? There isn't any uh, prescription on the part of FHIR uh, standard that you have to support um, a full CRUD uh, 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 workflow that you, FHIR is envisioned that you are able to create and update and, and read and delete uh, resources that are sitting in these databases, but th that does not necessarily uh, have to be the case. So if we kind of imagine that as the basis for what we're going to accomplish, uh, the next conversation is where is FHIR uh, in its um, uh, life cycle, right? And Gartner has this great thing called the hype cycle uh, where if we kind of imagine uh, the, 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 uh, um, the hype cycle uh, looking something like this, right? They like to describe this as there's, there is some uh, technology spark down here that causes the, uh, the, the technology to come into being. Um, there is a point somewhere along the line where we are at, as Gartner describes it, the, the, the peak of inflated expectations. Uh, and then we go crashing down into the trough of delusionment where everything we thought that uh, the, the, the technology was going to do doesn't turn out to be true, but eventually we climb on up this uh, plateau of productive use. And certainly fire um, is, in most people's uh, mind right now, fire is, is somewhere over here still climbing up the far side of the uh, levels of expectations that it's going to do. Uh, and eventually, we're hoping we can get past all the things that fire should do and get out here into some level of productive use. And productive use uh, can be measured in stages. That's one of the things I'd like to talk about is um, how do we get past 
you know, things like, gosh, fire is, is going to provide interoperability uh, between multiple locations uh, and effectively become a master patient index, right? Th those are the things that fire uh, has um, uh, on its list of, of, of expectations that eventually people will probably figure out are a little bit uh, too aggressive. Um, I, I think that, that the, the aspects of fire, as we talked about up here, that are interesting um, apply both within the four walls of an institution, but also potentially across multiple institutions. So if we kind of look at, uh, if we were imagining a, a workflow uh, of some sort, we can, we can imagine today, just to give an example of what a workflow might look like, we can imagine today that um, I've got, we'll, we'll start with a, a bedside device, for example. So if this device is uh, quite literally hooked up to a patient where it's collecting vitals information, we can kind of think today about how is it that the device information is moving from the device all the way back to the EMR. So back to my, uh, to my original question, my original picture, I've got my HIS database on the left, and I've got a way inside of my HIS application to view this device data, right? So as a user, I can log in and take a look at this. The question is, how am I going to get the device data uh, from the device all the way back to the HIS? And today, let me just draw today's typical picture. Um, not prescribing any architecture, but this is pretty normal that I would buy a uh, Space Labs or a Well Challenge server. There would be some proprietary connection to, to many of these devices that are floating around in the institution. And this database right here would be owned by the central monitoring station. And we would have an HL7 database. The first thing that we would be sending over would probably be ADT data. Right, so we're loading the patients into the patient monitoring database over here. The reason we want that is when I am a caregiver and I'm accessing this device, um, I'd like to round trip and query and ask, um, maybe barcode this patient and collect information about the patient and load it into the device. So I might have the admitting height and weight or I could have the date of birth that I'm loading into the device over here. And that round trip, I don't have anybody to ask um, that question um, other than my own database right here. So in order for that database to, to hold the information that I'd like, it has to come across in an ADT feed. Now likewise, when the data um, is going to go back the other direction, we build another interface the other direction. We use an HL7 result probably to publish the data back into this database so that it can um, deal with the display of that data off here to my caregiver. So that's, that's the, a typical workflow. And just to give an example of what it might look like with fire, again, same, same general uh, picture, which is I've got my HIS, and I've got my device, and I've got my patient over here hooked up to this device. Uh, what's different here is that the, uh, the device itself could have the opportunity uh, through a fire API to do two things. The first is that as a caregiver, again, I, I present myself to this device, I barcode the patient. Um, what can happen in the barcode is rather than having to talk to an intermediary server owned by uh, the, the, the device manufacturer, instead through Fire, I'd have the ability to talk uh, directly to Epic or directly to Cerner and ask it a question like, you do a search on your active database and find this patient ID or this account number, whatever it happens to be on the barcode that's on the patient, and return that to me. So, right, th th this is a query interface uh, through Fire. So we've eliminated the, 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 the potential challenge that's associated with um, having to have another application and another HL7 v2 interface be part of the mix. The other part then we can imagine is that as this guy is producing results over here, um, he, he can deliver those rather than proprietarily delivering them to a central station. He could have the option of creating a, a observation uh, off in the HIS directly. So th this is a, another new interesting if I, opportunity through FHIR where not only can I query, but I can do a create of an observation. So this gives an example 
of how uh, something like Fire um, has a pretty big impact on the workflow that, that's uh, floating around inside um, an institution. Um, you can imagine now that if I have the ability to, 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 uh, to talk to my Epic or my Cerner at any time and ask it questions like, um, what's the current list of medications or what's the bed roster uh, for, the, for this nursing wing, um, the reliance on potentially st stale ADT data uh, is lower. So lots of opportunity. I'd love to take some questions uh, at the end of this around um, this concept of how might we use fire. Um, we can kind of take it one step further and imagine that, you know, if there's a, a cloud that's swimming around out here uh, with a, a caregiver, let, let me show you another, another example of um, a workflow, and then I'll talk about how HL7 gets real. Um, if that's my internet, and I can imagine that on the far side of the cloud, I've got some application over here. Um, inside my, my, I put a firewall in play, and I've got Epic sitting here in the middle. Uh, and inside of Epic, of course, I've got a proprietary database. And as a user of Epic or Cerner, I'd like to take effectively some small part of my data that's present in my database and allow this application in the cloud to have access to it so that it can do some diagnostic activity for me. Um, the way we've had to do that historically is very similar to the device example where I would be pushing substantial amounts of information off to a database that's sitting here uh, in the cloud and then as a user over here, I have to represent myself as a user on the web in order to get the analysis complete. Uh, one of the things that's happening with, with FHIR is the ability to, um, to, to not necessarily push the data into the cloud, but rather um, through a, 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 um, an API called SMART. So there's this idea of a SMART app. I've got the ability for this guy to have um, limited access uh, to data that's sitting over here. So you can imagine that if, if I've got a, uh, a Cerner power chart application, for example, and I've got around the outside of this a bunch of buttons and I've got content uh, here in the, uh, in the middle of my screen, right, all my content about my patient is present here, that content is typically populated from my database and put onto my screen. One of the interesting opportunities with SMART is to say, I would like to uh, choose to take content from my, from my um, uh, cloud-based application. And the interesting part then is uh, send in real time some small bit of data to the cloud and have that cloud uh, present uh, a portion of my user experience in, inside my window here. So it's not a push and deliver and use in the future, but instead I've chosen a, uh, a patient and that data has come out of my, um, my database and has commingled with um, data that's come off of, of my cloud-based application. So that, that's an interesting um, opportunity. L let me switch gears and talk briefly about the, uh, I guess, how to learn more, how to dig into more of the specification, uh, more of the technical details. Um, the very short version is, and I, we'll send out these uh, URLs after the fact, but if you go to uh, hl7.org uh, slash fire, right, th there's the, the, the URL that you would like to go to. Um, there's a bunch of different versions of fire that are floating around. The, mo the most recent version of fire that we have uh, is the draft standard for trial use uh, number two. That's the ballot edition that we just uh, finished balloting here in May. And if you take a look at this, you'll see that the full specification is available uh, for you to take a look at. And one of the interesting uh, things to do besides read the, the potentially the, the introduction, notice there's an executive summary, a developer's uh, introduction, and a clinical introduction. To give a flavor of what this looks like is we can go take a look at uh, the resource list, for example. And uh, in the resources, what we see is a, a wide mix of uh, resources that are available. The, the goal in FHIR is to define about 100 resources, and each resource can then be extended. And you see things in here that sort of smell like um, 
clinical concepts, right? So we've got things like a diagnostic uh, re report or a diagnostic order. We also have things like a patient. So this is somewhat similar to, and if you're an HL7 V3 person, you'll, you'll see this being kind of like the REM. Uh, in V2, these are like uh, a PID segment. So we can see these are the things that just like in HL7 V2, we have something like marital status or we have birth date. And you can look at these in a number of different ways, one of which is in kind of a, a tree form. You also can click on the UML version if you're more of a uh, UML modeling kind of person and see the relationships that go back and forth between these. So again, very, um, very much like an HL7 PID segment uh, or a chunk of an, of an RMEM. And maybe the most uh, um, easy to understand form is much like a, a, a PID table here where we can see, for example, there's some number of identifiers for a patient uh, and some number of names for a patient. And just like in a, in a you know, PID3 drill down environment, I can drill on a, on a data type or drill on a particular thing and it will provide um, details of each part of the, um, of the virtual segment here. So that's the, that's the first place to get a little more information from a technical perspective. Um, the next comment I want to make is about how is it, this is going to get real and in what, um, in, in what speed are we going to go through. Um, the Argonaut project, if you, if you per, poke around on the internet, you'll find that the Argonaut project is sponsored by uh, these organizations, including uh, Epic and Cerner, uh, Meditech and, and McKesson on the vendor side, and folks like Intermountain Health and Mayo and partners on the provider side. We're working together to produce um, a very limited version of uh, this vision, right? How do we get our feet wet enough that we can do uh, useful things, including some of those smart applications I talked about? So these are the resources that we're working on. Notice that we don't have a, uh, a full version of these resources. It's the beginnings of this. There is a data access framework. That's what DAF stands for. This is a US-centric meaningful use oriented environment. The whole point of this is to say, let's, let's start with, this, with, with something that's incredibly simple, which is a limited amount of patient information and to get the same information that we asked from a meaningful use standpoint, which is give me a list of medications, give me a list of problems, give me a list of allergies, and allow me to take a look at lab tests. So these are the things that are coming as part of the Argonaut project. And the Argonaut project uh, is effectively a profiled version of, the, uh, of a limited set of the fire resources. And this stuff is coming um, quicker than I would have first imagined. So we saw the list of, of vendors that are involved. Um, we can take a look at um, these vendors. Uh, in fact, if you, if you poke around, uh, you'll find a couple interesting um, URLs, one of which is if you go to um, uh, fire.cerner.com, right, what you can see is the Argonaut flavor of the, um, uh, of the resources. So as an example, we can see the, um, some of the, the technical details around how is it we're using OAuth 2 to authenticate and eventually you can browse, browse around and see things like, gosh, what does the patient look like uh, in Cerner's initial implementation of um, this Argonaut-centric fire resource. So we saw the HL7 version of the, of the resource. It had many, many attributes. We can see that, again, Argonaut is focused on just a handful of these that are the same things we pick up uh, when we um, are doing meaningful use. So that's the, the, the Cerner flavor of this. Uh, we can do the same thing and, and take a look at the Epic flavor of this uh, with the, that will talk about the, um, the same meaningful use or data access framework environments. If you sign up on the web, you can actually um, gain access to the specification, which again has the same um, attributes that Cerner did. Uh, this also has the, the ability to, to uh, run this interactively, right? So I can literally query a, um, an instance of Epic and get a JSON version of the, of the resource 
returns me. So this is what an HL7 fire um, resource looks like in its very skinny form courtesy of, of, of the Argonaut project uh, and it happens to be encoded uh, in a um, in the JSON format rather than in the uh, XML format. We can also see that we can get you know, references back and forth. So this is an, an example of a reference or a pointer to another resource. In this case, we're pointing to a practitioner or a, a, a physician that is uh, the care provider for this patient. This is, again, one of the interesting aspects of FIRE is the fact that you obviously can link from one to another resource because you have access to, to go back and talk to any resource at, at any time. Um, the last uh, website I'm going to go to is the Smart App. And this is just the example of some of the apps that are floating around. Some of these are very real and available today. Others of these are uh, still in development. The goal is that if you're using the SMART framework, uh, you, can, you can provide high quality um, tooling that not every EMR might have on its own. So for example, uh, here is a, uh, a chart that can, or an app that can take um, basically blood chemistry and um, draw a very nice uh, version of a chart for a uh, cardiac risk. So if I actually open this up, this is a live version of the application that imagine I'm logged into my Epic or my Cerner, I've selected uh, Carl as my patient and there's this ability for it to get, again, very limited information, demographic information courtesy of that fire environment and we can see that uh, it's returned to me based on the LDL and HDL cholesterol values that it was able to get out of the lab tests, my, um, my, my, my risk. And I could obviously show this to a patient if I was a caregiver or I could um, also uh, take a look at this uh, directly as a caregiver and, and interpret the results from my, my patient. So clearly there's a bunch of different um, examples of, of applications that are floating around. Um, I would encourage you to, to, to take a look at those if there's a, 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 an interest in um, understanding, you know, in any of the, the types of things that might eventually exist as part of the, 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 the uh, SMART framework. Um, so we looked at Argonaut, we looked at uh, Cerner, we looked at Epic, uh, we looked at SMART. So I'm, I'm eager to take uh, Q&A and, and keep this more in the spirit of a whiteboard session and um, interactive. I'll go ahead That's and open great. it up to questions.